Hello there, this is Angie Elliott from the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to our Facebook Live uh, discussion today. I'm the Vice President of Member Engagement and Small Business for the Chamber, and uh, we feel really uh, blessed to have some great uh, experts joining us for today's conversation. Today we're going to be discussing mitigating risks as employers are uh, reopening their business. So whether you're an essential business that has been open for the past couple months, or whether or not you've had to cease operations and are now transitioning back into being open, I'm certain you're going to find a lot of great information today. You're going to hear from HR and legal experts on topics that are um, critical for all businesses, regardless of your industry or your size. And as a membership organization, the Chamber has over 1,700 members, and we feel really fortunate to have a wide range of expertise that we can draw on for this uh, programming that we've been doing. And I hope you've had a chance to check out some of that programming on our resource page, uh, wichitachamber.org slash COVID dash hyphen, excuse me, COVID hyphen 19 is uh, the Wichita Resource Center and it has a lot of great programming from us and as well as members as many of our members. So today we have Shelby Smith from ISI Environmental Services as our moderator and to provide some HR information. We also have uh, Mary Jean bogner Wary from National Screening Bureau to provide HR perspective and a partner with the law firm Fulston, uh, Teresa Shoulda is also joining us today. The discussion is meant to provide information and updates regarding general legal and HR issues, and it's not intended to provide advice on specific compliance issues. So to stay current with changing laws and guidance, please consult legal counsel for advice that's specific to your business. And we know that you're gonna to continue to encounter more HR and legal questions in the coming uh, weeks and months. So starting next week, the chamber is going to make available a resource called uh, Think HR. And it's an online platform and an app that includes a wide variety of HR and legal resources, some training courses, regulatory alerts, and access to HR experts. This is a resource typically only available to members that participate in our Nexus health insurance program, but we're going to widen that, broaden the scope to, to all of our membership. So stay tuned for more information on that. So I think that we're ready to dive into the conversation. I want to say hello, Shelby. How are you today? Oh, we've got you muted, I think. Sorry about that. Thank okay. you, Angie. Thanks for having me here today. And I'm excited to be a, a part of the um, part of the panel today and moderating the discussion today. Um, like Angie said, my name is Shelby Smith and I'm from ISI Environmental Services. And um, we are an environmental health and safety um, services company. So we work with other companies on making sure that they meet their compliance requirements. Um, and I am um, responsible for all the human resources there at ISI. So I'm excited to be joined today by Teresa and Mary Jean. And so I'd just like to take an opportunity to let them introduce themselves. So Teresa, how about, how about you? Thanks, Shelby. Um, I'm Teresa Shoulda, and I'm an attorney at the Folston Seekin Law Firm. Um, we are a uh, full service law firm serving clients um, in a range of areas uh, both in Wichita, throughout the state, and the Midwest region. Um, I am an employment lawyer. I've been practicing employment law throughout my legal career. Um, I typically advise uh, employers on compliance-related issues and uh, hoping that I can provide some helpful feedback today. All right, thank you, Teresa. All right, Mary Jean, could you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Mary Jean bogner wary with National Screening Bureau. And we have a goal to make every hire a successful hire for our clients. We provide background checks, drug testing, and right fit hire assessments to help with that goal. Um, my official title is VP of Project Management. However, I get to do a little bit of everything, um, including interacting with our clients. And over the past several months, many of our clients have opted to hire remotely and we've been able to assist them with that process by providing them with some electronic delivery and signature collection on their pre-hired paperwork. And um, we also provide electronic I-9s, which has been especially useful during this time. And I would just like to thank the chamber for having me and I look forward to our discussion this morning. 
All right. Thanks, Mary Jean. Um, so we will go ahead and dive right in here. We've got a, a long list of things to kind of address today, but maybe just to get started, um, Teresa, do you think um, as you could um, provide just kind of like a high level overview of what are some of the legal considerations that um, the employers need to be aware of as they're looking to, um, to bring people back to work, either if they've been, um, you know, having um, remote work, um, employees working remotely or whether they've had um, furloughs or layoffs. Um, but, you know, as companies are looking to come back, what are some of the things um, from a legal perspective that they really should be aware of? Well, of course, you know, top of the list is going to be safety. Um, there is guidance uh, from many, re in many resources, there's CDC guidance, the, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment has provided guidance, our county has provided guidance, um, and OSHA has provided quite a bit of guidance, um, including some industry specific guidance um, on different um, engineering and administrative controls that employers in different industries can put forth as employees return to the workplace to, uh, to try to minimize any COVID-19 related risk. And I think key, especially as OSHA is promoting key to this analysis is doing a very, a specific hazard assessment of, of your specific workplace. And, and all workplaces are different. My office setting workplace is gonna be dramatically different from a restaurant uh, or a, a manufacturing um, um, facility. So it's important to really individually assess what the hazards are in your specific workplace and seek out that guidance um, to, to determine what kind of engineering controls. So engineering controls are things like uh, workplace barriers, PPE, things like that. And then administrative controls such as staggering work schedules, um, um, telework as, a, as an ongoing option, uh, what kind of um, uh, um, processes and procedures you can put in place to, to try as best you can to minimize any COVID-19 related risk. There's also a myriad of laws that employers need to, to keep in mind as employees come back. Um, a lot of you may have applied for those PPP loans and they, they, uh, they have uh, various uh, guidelines in terms of maintaining payroll numbers and things like that. Um, the, the Congress passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provides for paid leave, uh, tax subsidized paid leave uh, under certain COVID-19 related issues. And then there is traditional laws that we always have to pay attention to. The Americans with Disabilities Act for employees or, or applicants with disabilities, how that interacts with the COVID-19 situation that we're in uh, especially with those uh, employees with high risk conditions. The Family and Medical Leave Act, if you're a covered employer, um, could apply. Um, and of course, all of the anti-discrimination laws, making sure that we're, that we're applying all processes and procedures in a uniform way is important. All right, thank you. And you've mentioned a couple of different things. Um, you know, you mentioned the PPE as an engineering control and um, and so and you're starting to see around more people wearing face masks when they go out in public and the CDC is, has um, encouraged some of that. So, um, you know, kind of another question is, can a business require employees to wear PPE or um, submit to temperature checks or, or those sorts of things when, as they come back? So in the, in, during the COVID-19 global pandemic, the answer is yes subject to some qualifications. Um, so let's talk about PPE first. Um, the, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency that administers um, most of the anti-discrimination laws, they have come out with some very helpful guidance um, addressing some of these questions. And they have uh, said that yes, employers can require employees to wear uh, or to don PPE. Um, masks, gloves, and the like. Now, the caveat on that is that some employees may need reasonable accommodations associated with either a disability or perhaps a religious accommodation. Um, for example, you may have employees who have latex allergies and can't wear latex gloves. So you might have to provide non-latex gloves. 
You may have employees, uh, if you have deaf employees, they may need um, masks that allow for lip reading. Um, you may have employees who have breathing issues related to masks. So the, the caveat on the requirement to wear PPE is to make sure that you are assessing those requests for accommodations from employees with disabilities or who make uh, requests related to religious dress accommodation. The other caveat is paying attention to wage and hour rules. So uh, with non-exempt or hourly employees, um, uh, you, you may need to make sure that employees are on the clock when they're donning and doffing PPE, depending on you know if they're gearing up in a gown and a mask and a visor, that can take a little bit of time there. So just pay attention to those wage and hour issues as well. Um, on temperature checks, so temperature checks are considered a medical examination. It is, it is taking somebody's temperature is considered a medical examination. And under normal times, uh, when we don't have a global pandemic, um, uh, employers have to have a, a good justifiable reason for conducting a medical examination on an employee because the Americans with Disabilities Act regulates uh, when employers can do those medical examinations or inquiries. And um, they have to be, medical examinations have to be business related and consistent with business, just uh, job related and consistent with business necessities. The same is true during a global pandemic, but the EEOC has come out and said, the global pandemic justifies conducting temperature checks. So employers are allowed to, collect, uh, to uh, conduct temperature checks um, or health screening questionnaires uh, for employees returning to work. Again, pay attention to those wage and hour rules. If you have employees that have to wait um, to get their temperature or health screen done, make sure that you're complying with your requirements on, on paying those employees for that time. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add too on some of the masks that um, the, and the PPE. I think um, it's also something to mention that um, you know, if you're having a cloth mask or you're having a surgical mask or even a dust mask, that those are, um, you know, there's no regulations around those. But once you move into a filtering mask, um, which the most common one, even though they're hard to come by these days, is the N95, um, is that OSHA does regulate those in the workplace. Um, and so even if they're wearing them voluntarily, there's still some responsibility on the employer to, um, um, to go through a few steps because um, um, because they are using that filtering uh, face piece, so which it would be the N95s and above. So there's um, additional types of um, of masks and respirators that go above the N95. Um, but again, starting at that kind of level, um, there are some responsibilities that employers have um, if they're having employees wear it, even voluntarily in the workplace. So just something to keep in mind as well. Um, so Mary Jean, you had indicated when you did your introduction that you guys have actually been helping a lot of people hire um, during this time. And so what are some of the um, kind of some of the changes that you've seen on a hiring end um, for, um, for bringing people on during this time? And you specifically mentioned um, some of the I-9 requirements um, and some of the electronic um, paperwork requirements. But what are you seeing as far as kind of the obligations for employers as they're hiring people and maybe not even meeting them, maybe just doing everything electronically. Right. Um, so it, it depends on whether the employee is, is returning after a furlough or um, after they're returning after being terminated and then they're being rehired. So if an employee was furloughed and by that, I mean that they were treated um, like they were on leave, they had a reasonable expectation of employment at all times, you can continue to use the I-9 form that the employee completed at the beginning of employment. So that's, that's easy. Now for those that were rehiring, um, if it's been um, within three years that they completed their original I-9, they um, can either the employer can fill out section three or they can complete a whole new I-9. Now, if it's been beyond three years since they completed their original I-9, 
then you have to do a new I-9. And there's um, some guidelines because not every case is real simple. Um, if an employee's employment authorization status hasn't changed from their previous I-9, there's no need to gather additional documentation. You just provide the date of the rehire and any name changes in section three and sign and date the form. Now, if their employment authorization has expired on the original I-9, then you have to re-verify the employment authorization in section three and provide the rehire date. And the, if the previous form I-9 isn't the current version, you'll wanna complete a section three on the current version of the form. Um, if section three was previously completed on their original I-9, um, but they're still within the three years of when they originally were hired, um, you complete section three on a new form I-9 and attach it to the previously completed one. So there's lots of guidelines and I um, want to refer everybody to the USCIS handbook. That's where I got this information. Um, I'm a little spoiled. Our system, you just click a button that says rehire. And we go in and just fill in the information that it asks for. It um, really helps with to make sure that we're completing the right I-9 and that kind of thing. So that's, that's one thing that um, it, we're getting a lot of calls about in our office. So uh, anybody who's dealt with I-9s knows there's a handbook and you have to read it carefully. And um, so Mary Jean, um, the Department of Homeland Security um, deferred the requirement for employers to receive Form I-9 documents in person with new employees as a, re as a result of the pandemic. So is that still in effect? I mean, how are employers dealing with that if they hired somebody and who has solely been working remotely? What is their next step? Well, um, they did offer um, a deferment for looking at those identity documents in person. And you can do that um, by fax or email or over a, a webinar. And um, the main things to take away from that are that um, once that employee comes back, uh, you have three days, three business days to complete the in-person verification. Um, the original announce, announcement stated that the provisions are in effect until May 19th or within three business days after the termination of the national emergency. So we're quickly approaching that um, May 19th date. Um, they do instruct employers to monitor DHS and ICE websites for additional updates and when extensions will be terminated um, and when normal operations resume. So they may end up extending that date. Uh, and you wanna make sure that if, you, if you've used this option that you have to be hiring remotely. You can't um, have someone working in-house and um, verify online. If they're in-house, um, you need to collect the paperwork and view it yourself. And another issue that's been popping up with I-9s is um, that the identity documents may have expired and the worker has no way to renew, like say a driver's license. And so um, what happens is they have their documentation for the I-9, but it may be expired. So the DHS has issued a temporary policy for that as well. So um, beginning May 1st, any identity documents found in list B that are, are expired after March 1st, 2020, um, and they're not extended by the licensing authority, they enter that um, in section two as a valid receipt. And um, then the document information in section two, um, you just put the expired document and in the additional information field, 
you um, write COVID-19. And within 90 days after um, DHS's termination of the temporary policy, the employer will be required to present a valid um, and expired document. And um, once they do present that unexpired document, um, you just record the number and um, of the document in as the document is actually presented and initial and date the change. So that's what we're seeing with I-9s. It's happened quite a bit, especially with this um, expired document issue. All right, thank you, Mary Jean. Sure. Um, so um, kind of as people are starting to come back, a lot of people have been at home for different reasons and, um, and are now starting to come back. So um, Teresa, do you have any advice for employers on what to do if they have an employee who says that they're too scared to come back to work or they don't feel safe coming back to work and how they should respond in that situation? Yeah, I've got to tell you that that is the question we're starting to get them the most often now as businesses are reopening is, is you know, I have employees who just say that they're scared. They think it's too soon um, to reopen and to, to come back out in the world. Um, I think employers need to, to be cognizant of several different laws and how they interact with each other in, in, in answering this question or addressing this question. Um, so I mentioned earlier um, a law that Congress passed called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That law applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. So if you're a very, very large employer, it doesn't apply to you, but the employers with fewer than 500, this law provides for paid leave, tax subsidized paid leave uh, that, will, that will cover COVID related absences. So you can have employees who still need to stay at home for a COVID related reason, one of the reasons is if school or childcare uh, provider interruption. So the schools have closed and they're, you know, schools, public schools anyway, are supposed to be finished in a week or so, but this law extends beyond the school year. And so if the summer programs are closed, if summer camps, summer daycare providers are closed, uh, then, then employees may still need to stay home to care for their children. And so this law provides up to 12 weeks of tax subsidized paid leave um, for that reason. Um, now I will say this is just another kind of FMLA leave. So employers who already uh, have the FMLA in effect, which are employers with 50 or more employees, uh, this is just another kind of FMLA. So if you have an employee who's already used four weeks of FMLA, then, then they get the remainder uh, eight weeks for, for this COVID-19 related reason. So employers need to pay attention to that law. There are other laws too. The, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you can have an employee who says, I don't wanna return to work because I fall into one of these high risk categories that the CDC has identified as being especially vulnerable to COVID-19. Well, that, uh, that high risk, uh, medical condition may very well be considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which means that you, the employer will need to engage in an interactive dialogue with the employee about whether or not the employee needs any reasonable accommodations. Um, one reasonable accommodation could be continued leave from work, um, but there are a lot of other reasonable accommodations. If the employee has been successfully teleworking, can you continue to successfully telework? Is that a reasonable accommodation? Um, and then all those OSHA related uh, administrative and engineering controls, they can also be considered reasonable accommodations. So can you structure your work environment that will, that will um, minimize or mitigate those risks that the employee is concerned about? Staggered work schedules, so not everybody is showing up at one time. Staggered work stations, barriers between work stations, heightened sanitizing and, and, and hygiene, uh, paying attention to heightened hygiene. All of these things kind of double as both safety measures and potentially accommodations for those employees. And then the other big law that I always, I just don't want employers to forget about is the regular old Family and Medical Leave Act, which applies to employers with 50 or more employees. 
Um, I do want to note that the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, it applies to employees with 15 or more employees. So if you're a smaller employer, you're still covered under a, a, um, um, a, a law that could be in play here. And then the Kansas Act Against Discrimination, which is the state counterpart, and it, it's the same uh, requirements in terms of accommodating employees with disabilities, it applies to employers with four or more. So even the smallest employers have obligations here to work with employees with disabilities. And then the Family and Medical Leave Act uh, allows employees to take leave uh, if they have their, a serious health condition. If an employee turns in a medical certification from their treating healthcare provider that says this employee can't work because they have a high risk condition and I'm telling them they need to stay away from work, they may qualify for FMLA. Same is true if they need to care for certain family members. So if they say, I am, I am my wife has a, uh, has a high risk healthcare condition and she needs my help, um, again, they may qualify for traditional FMLA. So you wanna follow your regular FMLA procedures, give those employees the FMLA packet, rely on them to, to turn in their medical certifications and then review the medical certification to see if they qualify. And if they qualify, they qualify. So I just wanna make sure employers aren't forgetting about those other laws out there as employees are returning to the workplace. So you mentioned um, some of the um, high risk conditions, people in vulnerable populations. I mean, how far can or should an employer go in trying to protect those vulnerable populations? Um, for example, um, would, you know, if you have somebody that's older, would that create issues for the employees or certain, something special you should do for them? Um, you know, what, what's the differences there if you've got somebody in a high risk category? So I think you want to pay attention to what the employee is seeking and rely on the employee to know their own health and their own medical conditions and their own possible disabilities um, and, and to seek accommodations or additional leave when they need them. Um, you shouldn't speculate about what this employee who is in a particular uh, age category or who you know from prior conversations has a certain health category or, or health condition, you shouldn't speculate about what they can and can't do or what they can don't and don't need. You need to rely on those employees to come forward and tell you if they need some sort of special accommodation. Um, I think there's a pretty big risk uh, if you start to say, well, we'll let everyone under 40 show up to work, but you folks who are 40 and over, you need to stay home from work on this unpaid furlough. Well, that's a real big risk of age discrimination. Uh, even if your intention is to be, uh, you know, that you're trying to protect these older workers, that's a that's a big uh, risk of age discrimination there because it impacts these older workers. Um, so I think employers need to listen to their employees, and and if their employees come forward and seek accommodations or express concerns, respond to those concerns and those requests, uh, but don't speculate about them and don't. Uh, jump the gun and, and make assumptions about uh, what employees um, can and can't do. Thank you. Um, and I'll open this up to, the, um, you know, all of our panelists, um, this question. So, um, you know, we've been seeing, you know, the guidance from the CDC has been stay home if you're sick, um, you know, if you're showing any symptoms. Um, but if you have an, if an employer has somebody come to work and they appear sick, um, so they, they appear to have symptoms or um, you know, maybe they're coughing a lot or they're acting sick. I mean, what's an employer able to do in that situation if they've got somebody who presents as, um, as they might potentially be sick? Send them home. <laughs> that, that is another area that the EEOC has come out and given specific guidance on. Employers uh, can send an employee home who is exhibiting uh, COVID uh, symptoms, um, coughing, fever. Uh, this, the list of symptoms seems to grow as the weeks drag on, but um, this, the EEOC has specifically said that employers can send those employees home, isolate them immediately from other employees. Um, and, and ask them to stay home. And the CDC has uh, provided some guidance on uh, when employees who have tested positive for COVID, when they can return to work. I don't have that guidance off the top of my head, but the CDC does have guidance on uh, return to work for 
um, employees who have tested positive and how long they need to be symptom free and the like. Great. Is there any, um, I mean, Teresa, have you heard anything related to if, um, you know, if an employee feels that their employer brought them back too early, um, you know, and then, you know, then they got sick, kind of what the responsibility there is on the employer? Well, this is one of those kind of, we're going to have to see how it plays out. Uh, so, you know, the first thought is, you know, if the employee is alleging that they got sick because they were in the workplace, well, the first thing that comes to mind is workers' compensation. And so workers' compensation um, in Kansas, it can cover occupational illnesses or illnesses that are the result of work, but I think that it is... Uh, it'll be a big question of whether or not the employee actually did contract COVID-19 in the workplace. Um, there are going to be some industries where the connection might seem um, um, more concrete. A healthcare worker who was working in a COVID-19 wing and treating COVID-19 positive cases uh, who then comes down with COVID-19, that connection might seem more direct than an employee who uh, is in a different kind of work environment where the risk is much, much lower. Um, so there's definitely always gonna be that issue of, of can the employee actually establish that their positive COVID-19 diagnosis was the result of the workplace, which I think could be very difficult given all the unknowns. Um, those cases will be litigated through the court system and we'll have to see how they come out um, there's also a question of whether or not normally workers comp is the is the sole remedy for employees who are injured on the job so they can't um, seek remedies outside of the work comp system, which is a very regimented system um, that uh, caps uh, damages at certain uh, points. Um, and so then there's the question, well, could the employee um, seek tort remedies against an employer for negligence, for, um, for, for failing to implement safe uh, practices? And um, again, I think we're, we're just going to have to see how those cases play out. And there will be that big issue of, was the workplace one where that was made the employee particularly susceptible to COVID? And then did the employee or employer implement all of the safety protocols that they could have that were recommended by the various uh, agencies and industry organizations um, to take care. So I think we're going to see those cases play out, unfortunately, um, over the next couple of years um, and see how they come out. But um, and again, of course, OSHA, you know, OSHA can um, uh, can get complaints about OSHA violations. So I think the most important thing that employers need to do is make sure that they are staying up to date you know, don't go to the OSHA guidance three or four weeks ago and then think you've got it covered. Go back to the OSHA guidance, go back to the CDC page, keep refreshing your knowledge as this goes on because the guidance does get updated um, periodically. And so just make sure that you've really got yourself covered in all of those areas and that you're taking all the precautions um, that is being recommended by all of those organizations. Okay, and um, so Teresa, you mentioned OSHA, and OSHA came out um, early on, and, and a lot of the question has been around, uh, you know, is a COVID case um, a recordable in a recordable illness under um, OSHA? And so, some of the based on some of the more recent OSHA guidance, um, you know, some of that depends on a lot of the same factors that Teresa just mentioned, you know, as far as if it can be shown to have happened in the workplace. Um, and is connected with the work. And, um, and so OSHA has also identified different um, risk levels um, related to, um, to COVID. And so kind of depending on where you would fall there, if you're on the low to moderate, there is not as much um, obligation to... Um, and so then I guess kind of the answer to whether or not it's an OSHA recordable illness is, um, is 
is it kind of depends. It depends on your situation, your industry, your, um, your risk levels. Um, um, so I think I see we've had one question come in through the chat. And I think that um, maybe Mary Jean, this is meant for you. She's asking which HRIS system do you use? Um, we are smaller, so we use um, a Zoho system, but uh, I definitely could throw out some names on um, what not to use that I've heard from clients, but I won't do that here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would recommend if she would go to, um, if she's a member or he's a member of SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, they have a blog there that you can get on and ask questions and other resource managers um, can put answers there. And I would think that would be a good place uh, for them to go and get some really candid answers as to if their systems are working for them. I've been on there and they do um, not hold back. So I think they would be honest with someone who's truly looking. All right, thank you. Um, Angie, have we had any other questions come through? Um, I haven't seen any come through. So if anyone um, has any, any questions that have been spurred from what you've heard already, or if there's something that uh, we haven't yet addressed, feel free to, to um, enter a question in the, on the Facebook um, chat, and we will try to get to that. Um, in the meantime, I thought maybe we could go back to some of the temperature checks. So Teresa talked a lot about it being a medical examination and kind of some of the legal aspects around it, but kind of from a, um, a practical standpoint, you know, how do employers do that? I mean, they can do that. So how do they do that? You're seeing a lot in of the um, touchless forehead thermometers, but what's the, I mean, what do you use for a cutoff? Where do you, um, you know, how do you, what are the practical considerations around being doing a temperature check? I don't know what the cutoffs are. I would say I would have to, you'd have to go to the CDC guidance and, and, and have them, you know, say what, what the cutoffs are for temperatures. You know, if I just, you know, if I just went for a brisk walk around the building and came in and got my temperature checked, is that going to modify it? Um, I do think that probably any any time you can um, have touchless uh, uh, health screening um, devices, that's going to be better. I do know that um, some of the organizations you can hire um, nursing students or or medical workers uh, to come in and do your health checks for you, so you have a, a professional who knows what they're doing and knows how to take safety precautions. So those are some options as well. Uh, you might contact um, local um, nursing schools or nurse practitioner schools, things like that, to see if they have any help or guidance out there uh, for resources for, for folks who know what they're doing when they come in and do these things and how to take precautions. Thank you. Well, and I've seen that um, the CDC, I think, defines a fever as 100.4 degrees. Um, the kind of the difference with the touchless, I think, is that you, you probably don't get as high of a reading. And so kind of kind of knowing what your what your device is doing and what it, how it's reading and kind of being able to make uh, make some judgments based on that as well um, is is something that we've kind of seen. And a lot, I mean, and obviously a lot of the guidance I'm reading is, is you, you can do these screenings, but we've all read, you know, the, the feedback that, you know, this, there's a period of time where people are completely asymptomatic, but still contagious with this disease. And so, you know, to doing temperature checks is not the end all be all to safe, uh, hygienic workplaces where you're implementing other measures. Um, to ensure that, uh, or to min minimize as much as possible uh, the risks associated with this disease. So I, I don't think temperature checks should be the last thing that you do. I think you gotta make sure that you're, you're doing other things uh, as OSHA and the other agencies have advised. 
Okay, we have another question here. Um, can employers require employees to complete a health symptom survey, including travel history, exposure to other people with COVID, et cetera, before reporting to the work site for the day? So yes, the EEOC has come out and has said that you can, especially with travel, you can require reporting of travel from particular hotspots. Um, and, and, you know, of course, some of the state orders have in particular talked about individuals who have traveled to the state from hotspots are supposed to um, quarantine themselves for a certain period of time. Um, so yes, um, the EEOC does have guidance on that very specific question. Um, you know, under normal circumstances, the answer would be no, but because this, we are officially in a global pandemic, the EEOC has said that you can do these kind of questions, but stick to the script. Don't start to ask outside of COVID-19 related issues. Don't start to try to delve into employees um, medical history or personal life outside of what's relevant to the, the risk mitigation issues associated with COVID-19. And I think one thing to kind of be aware of too is that those are changing um, quite a bit. And so, um, so for Kansas, for example, um, if you go to the KDHE website, you can find their quarantine table and they actually just this week made quite a few changes to it. They actually um, removed a few um, locations from the mandatory quarantine requirements. Um, and then they added a, a couple recently as well. So just something to kind of be aware of that, um, that that's, pretty constantly changing and you need, need to be um, looking at that pretty frequently so that you have the most up-to-date information. All right, Angie, was there any other questions? I think we've uh, covered the ones that we've seen so far, um, but if people do have questions as they move into this, um, they can always reach out to us and we will be sure to connect them over the next you know, weeks and months with, um, with some of our members that have expertise in these different areas. Um, well, do any of our panelists have any final words of wisdom or encouragement you'd like to offer um, those that are watching? Mary Jean, you wanna start? Sure. Um, I'm looking forward to businesses reopening and our economy being restored. Um, I believe we'll bounce back better than ever. And um, I like to focus on positive changes that come about with for the COVID-19. Um, I know uh, we all appreciate our health and um, our families and our friends a little bit more than before all of this started. And uh, I wanna thank you for having me and I want everybody to have a safe day. Thank you. Teresa? Uh, my kind of parting words of encouragement for employers is to be flexible. Um, this is unlike anything that any of us have dealt with. And, and so um, I would encourage employers to, um, to really weigh and balance all of the interests involved and to be flexible. Um, you need to get up and you need to operate and you need to um, provide your services and your products. That needs to happen and it needs to happen soon. And it's important to weigh uh, that business necessity along with these legitimate fears and concerns that employees might have. And so I would just encourage employers to be flexible and to think outside the box and, and to, to um, uh, just uh, try, try, to, try to weigh all those interests as you're making decisions. Okay. And I guess kind of my last thoughts are that, you know, everybody's, um, you know, been under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure and no matter kind of where you're, where you're at or what you're doing, we're all experiencing this. And so, um, so just kind of, you know, take some time to, to listen to each other and um, connect with each other, even if it's virtually and, um, and just, you know, bear in mind that everybody's kind of dealing with their own unique situations. And sometimes it may be having a conversation with that person, with, with individuals about their individual situation. So, um, you know, I just really encourage, I like the flexibility that Teresa talked about and, you know, everything's just a little bit different now and we got to be looking at different ways of being able to do things. And, um, you know, I think we will get through this. I'm excited to see things starting to open back up as well. 
Um, and I think people are excited to kind of be getting out and doing things, but just remember to, to, to take your precautions and, um, you know, there's lots of things that you can do to kind of help um, control what you can. And so you may not have control of everything, but there are a lot of things that we can do um, to, to help um, control um, our work environment. So um, Angie, we appreciate you having me on today and I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shelby. Yeah, as, as our staff have been talking with chamber members um, over the past couple months and just checking in and seeing how we can assist with them, this is definitely a, a, um, a hot topic and something that people are um, just needing a lot of, a lot of assistance navigating through, through what, what's happening right now. So we appreciate um, Shelby, Teresa, and Regine, all of you, um, your expertise. I know you're incredibly busy and it's taken some time to prepare for this and to dedicate to the live broadcast. So we really appreciate um, Appreciate your time today. And also want to thank the, uh, those of you who've uh, joined us live on Facebook. We're going to watch it later on. Um, you can find a wide variety of information, as I mentioned before, on the Chambers um, Resource Center, which is wichitachamber.org slash COVID hyphen 19. And we will have a link um, posted um, in this session as well. So feel free to send that to the people you think would, would benefit from that. Um, and just a reminder, as I mentioned before, ne next week we're going to have more information about the Think HR online platform and uh, hope that we'll have a lot of people being able to take advantage of that resource. So uh, feel free to reach out to the chamber for any questions you may have. Um, we have, as I mentioned before, a lot of members who have expertise in different areas. And um, that's our job is to connect you with the resources and information that you need. So thank you again for joining us and have a great day.